Hello, everybody. I'm quite glad to uh, come here to uh, the office of the Huawei company. Uh, I, I must admit that all I will be talking about right now is a kind of improvis improvisation. The title of my presentation is, uh, uh, is here, Languages and Compilers, the Evolution of the Compiler Architecture. Here is my short self-presentation. My name is Eugene Zuev. Uh, uh, I am now I am a, a professor uh, in Innopolis University, a very new uh, university in the middle of Russia, not far from the city of Kazan. Uh, here are my major projects for last well 12 years, uh, starting from ICO compliant compiler for C++. Uh, it was quite a huge and dramatic work. Uh, I even have written a book about the story of developing this compiler. After this uh, big project related to the C++ language, I, was, I participated in a few uh, uh, projects related to other programming languages. As you might see, my main uh, professional interests are compiler construction, language design and the semantics of programming languages. So, all my, almost all my projects uh, were somehow about uh, or somehow around these topics. Scala, porting the Scala compiler to .NET. It was quite an interesting project. This is very pity that it was terminated. Uh, not because of me, but because of some uh, Microsoft guys, I guess. JavaScript and Swift compilers uh, were projects that I was running uh, being in uh, Samsung research in Moscow. And the last, my last position is now I am participating in various work related to Accord language. Probably some of you have heard about it. Uh, this is uh, a new programming language uh, developed by St. Petersburg team of Huawei. What I will be talking about uh, again, almost all these points are of my particular interest. So, compilation task. What does it mean in general? What, does, what is compilation in a narrow and in the wide sense? Uh, for Russian uh, listeners, compilation in широком или узком смысле. Advanced architecture. What does it mean? Advanced compiler uh, architecture. Or, speaking informally, how to turn compiler inside out. Как вывернуть компилятор наизнанку. And uh, probably the key point of my quick talk today is program semantic representation. And uh, finally, finally, uh, uh, one topic related to practical use of such a semantic representation in the topic of com in the problem of compiler integration into uh, integrated development environment. So these are. Uh, topics that I'm going to uh, touch somehow. By my opinion, the main, well, well, not uh, only, but one of main problems uh, in uh, current compiler-related research are as follows. <laughs> first of all, unsatisfactory language design. Uh, my first intention was to write ugly language design, but well, I, uh, I was trying uh, to be um, a little bit more polite. However, the current situation with language design is uh, cannot be uh, characterized uh, uh, can be characterized as very dramatic and uh, well very dramatic. Uh, simply speaking, most current languages are designed very bad. Excuse me. This is my personal opinion, and I can give I could give you a lot of examples of. Absolutely ugly, ugly uh, design of uh, almost all current languages. But unfortunately, this is not the ta not time to discuss uh, this about. The next point, uh, the ne next problem: efficient code generation. The first topic is out of the scope for today, and this problem. I I think that this problem in general is solved by convention uh, conventional compilers. People or compiler developers know how to generate highly efficient code. However, these two problems are still uh, very, very actual and dramatically actual, I would say. 
uh, I have even uh, wrote this point in, in red. Program understanding. Look, people know how to write programs. People know or developers know how to generate efficient code. But almost nobody knows how to make programs understandable. How to uh, help programmers understand, or not only authors of programs, but people who are reading programs written before, to understand it clearly. Uh, by my opinion, this is a very important point. And how to solve it? Uh, it, is not, it is still not clear how to solve uh, this problem related to program understanding. <laughs> and, as I have already mentioned, integration compilers into uh, development environment is also uh, quite an important uh, problem, task. Uh, it is being solved in many aspects. However, by my opinion, it is still far from uh, getting a perfect solution. Uh, excuse me if some of my, my slides seem to, be, uh, seem to you trivial. However, I have to start with such a trivial uh, illustration uh, in order to give you my, uh, my points, my, uh, my reasons and my thoughts. So, conventional compilation can be very easily represented uh, on a picture like this. We have a source code. This source code somehow gets converted to some intermediate representation, getting a target code as the result of the process. Uh, many years and even now such a uh, configuration seems to be obvious, self-understandable and perfect and no, people didn't uh, and still do not need anything else. And I, know, uh, I name this uh, scheme as a compilation in a narrow uh, sense. This is my important point, my key point. Uh, concerning this, uh, this uh, scheme. Producing machine co code is not the single compilation task and often it is even not the most important one. This is uh, probably this uh, looks a little bit uh, wrong for, for, for some people but my opinion is just that. In many cases, in very many cases uh, Code generation is not the, the very important, uh, very important, or the most important one. Program understanding or actions on uh, on the source code, different actions, not only code generation, is often is more important than just generation of the target code. Please. Uh, this is my uh, short explanation of my point of view. Uh, there are many actual tasks not related to producing ex uh, executable code. And many of these tasks, if not all of them, are at least of the same importance as the code generation. Legacy code reengineering main maintains and proving existing programs. Look, program is written once, well, in general, during some period, but it, it is used much longer than uh, it is written, if we are talking about big, serious uh, programs. So, maintenance and improving is, uh, is very important. Uh, program static analysis in very many aspects. Diagnostic without executing code. What did I write here? Well, you probably know the points uh, related to program static analysis problematic. Uh, understanding programs, again in red. I think that this is very, very important uh, point, uh, which is not reached by the compilation in a narrow, uh, in a narrow sense. Visualization, creating different diagrams, di different visual representations of program, etc. Testing and verification as the ideal uh, target of well of programming process to prove that a program meets requirements, performs uh, correctly uh, and uh, gets the result in a reasonable time. Again, <laughs> this is my key point. 
To solve these and similar tasks, we need full information about program semantics. Now I am coming closer to this point. We need all information about the source program. When you uh, compile a program, uh, getting a, co a target code, we do not need a lot of semantic information. It is quite enough for us to get just part of the information from the source code in order to get uh, to, to generate the code. However, to solve these uh, problems, we need the full information. And, well, I call this uh, semantic representation or something uh, like that, please. Uh, this is an improved, uh, more, ex uh, more extended scheme uh, that I call uh, compilation in a wide state. If we have such a full representation of the source uh, program semantics, we can write various clients that get uh, that get access to such a program semantic representation to solve various problems uh, from the previous slide uh, listed in the previous slide uh, static analyzers visualizers uh, uml based engineering tools verifiers proofers etc 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 okay next slide please of course i'm not the first who uh, uh, who is talking about this uh, these uh, problems. There are a lot of uh, products, a lot of researchers related to, uh, to, uh, related to such an approach, compilation in a wide, state, uh, wide uh, sense. Clockwork, Fortify, Coverity are well-known systems that help developers to improve the code and to get uh, uh, to perform various important operations on sort code uh, other than uh, code generation. Uh, another, uh, well, I have, already, I have mentioned that typically the, uh, such tools are either command line utilities or hermetic systems that cannot be extended easily. Well, of course, uh, I'm not completely uh, correct saying that, but in general, this is so. Uh, another point is that uh, those systems are quite expensive. I know, uh, in particular, that Coverity costs $5,000 for one working place, something like that. Uh, we, okay, and the, another, uh, another approach is to create open infrastructures or APIs uh, providing access to program semantics. Uh, next slide, please. And concerning the uh, second uh, direction, I would... Uh, show you some examples of uh, such an approach. Probably historically the first approach targeted at just getting semantic information about programs is so-called ACES, ADA Semantic Interface Specification. This, this was and is very powerful API uh, that can help developers to get all kinds of semantic information about an ADA program. Uh, it is quite old and uh, in the year of 1995 I took part in the implementation of this, of this interface. Uh, uh, I was participated in the early steps of this project and now ACES is the ICO standard by the way. Uh, some other uh, some other system, I won't touch this. This is a very interesting uh, project, Pivot. Björn uh, Straustrup, uh, the author of C++, is running this project. Uh, quite an interesting point, but, well, speaking informally, by my opinion, the uh, main disadvantage of this project is that uh, PhD students are, were responsible for this project. <laughs> uh, Björn Straustrup was just a supervisor. He wrote uh, conceptual uh, papers related to the, uh, this research and his PhD students were running this project. And this is the typical story. When a PhD student defends his or her thesis and leaves the university, uh, University in Tihasa, Tosten, I guess, uh, the project, uh, the project stops. 
Well, it seems to me that this happened to this, uh, this project. Uh, I know very well, very interesting uh, system called CCI, Common Compiler Infrastructure. Uh, I was working with guys from Microsoft, uh, developed this system, and well, I must admit that it, it was quite, quite interesting and powerful, powerful infrastructure. I have implemented the Zonon compiler using this uh, infrastructure. LLVM and Roslyn are the, probably the latest, latest systems that can be considered together with other features as open interfaces that can help us to get access to uh, all semantic features of source languages. C Sharp or Visual Basic probably uh, for, for in case of Roslyn and uh, C++, mainly C++ in case of LLVM. Thank you. Next slide, please. This is my favorite slide. <coughs> uh, I, uh, I will try to show you how the evolution of the compiler architecture is going or should be going, by my opinion. Uh, this is the conventional scheme. We have a source code, we pass it to a compiler, getting the object code as a result. What, what's happening inside the compiler, nobody, in general nobody knows and nobody is, in, is interested about that. There are some internal structures, there is probably a code generator who is responsible for, uh, for generating the code. However, the compiler is considered as a black box. Okay. Nobody knows what's inside and nobody is interested uh, in what's inside. Conventional mon monolithic compiler, as I mentioned. Next slide, please. Uh, the evolution goes further and now we have something that is called multi-target compilation system. It is also a very old uh, scheme when we have uh, a source language together with a series of, uh, of uh, generators or of clients, uh, in particular code generations for different compiler archite computer architectures. Now we have uh, clearly separated uh, components, front -end, so called front-end compiler that depends on the source language, some intermediate program representation that acts as a as a more or less independent component and a series of uh, clients or back-end processors including code generators and whatever uh, developers need. Uh, you know that the first example was GCC, GNU Compiler Collection. It was built uh, for, uh, using this, uh, this scheme. <coughs> okay. Now it is <laughs> oh, okay. 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 Let, let it be here. This is the third step uh, within this evolution. Look. Uh, by my opinion, the thing that was called compilation structures or intermediate program representation becomes program semantic representation and becomes the primary component of the, this architecture. First, we think about how to represent program semantics. And within that representation, we can have a lot of various functions and uh, front-end uh, front compiler becomes just one of such actions. I called it semantic representation generator. It takes the source program and generates this representation. So my idea is that the compiler, or as we uh, typically think about compiler, gets inverted to this situation. Compiler, uh, well, how it is called, uh, I have mentioned this name. Uh, compiler gets from inside out. Compiler of Arachevic and Iznanko. So this is my idea and notice this uh, source source element, why source program should be represented as a text. Why? 
It is a kind of convention that we follow for many years. But in general, source, source code can be represented in different, in different views. It can be just a text written in a sheet of paper. It can be represented as a sequence of bytes that are read from a port. Uh, or it can be an UML diagram. Why not? Uh, why not? Uh, people uh, design a program using this notation, very popular notation. One, why not to uh, force such a, uh, such a system to get uh, the source program in terms of UML diagrams? In general, this, is, uh, this might be uh, quite useful and natural. Uh, okay, let's go on. Uh, this is the same picture uh, represented in a little bit different, in a little bit uh, conventional way. We have program semantic representation, a structure, a complicated structure, uh, to get, together with the interface and different kinds of source code representation can serve, a, a serve as an in input for, to, to this, uh, to this uh, complex and a series of clients that perform some useful actions. Look, code generation, static analyzers, virtual machines, by the way, optimizers, etc., etc. Go on, please. Uh, well, uh, I can easily skip this slide. This is a little bit more technical uh, idea related to uh, semantic representation. Uh, semantic representation should be uh, it, its complexity very much depend on uh, on the complexity of the source language for simple languages it, it can be quite compact and easy to understand for uh, for source uh, for source uh, programs for example in c++ this is extremely uh, complicated but nevertheless we always can uh, separate such a representation into three parts lexical interface, syntax or structural interface, and semantic interface as it is. Uh, well, well, okay, nothing, uh, nothing to comment uh, on, this slide, uh, on this slide, I guess. Uh, okay, uh, this is uh, my thoughts related, uh, my thoughts about how such a semantic representation should probably look like. Uh, my idea is that, okay, when we deal with the compilation process, uh, the first data structure we think about is obviously an abstract syntax tree. It adequately represents the structure of a program. This is very natural uh, uh, representation. And my, so my idea is that such a tree with, very, uh, with a lot of modification should serve as a, a basis, uh, oh, as the basis of semantic representation. Uh, here is a, an example. I must admit this is quite a, an old, uh, old slide, but it is still <laughs> quite actual. This is a very schematic uh, artificial example of a part of a C++ program with class declaration and function declaration. Function declaration accepts uh, some parameter and there is the local C variable of type, of class type C capital. And here is very schematic and simplified representation of the abstract syntax tree built for this, uh, for this code snippet. Well, I won't go into details. The only point I would like to emphasize is different kind of relation between, between nodes of such a tree. Look, red are structural relations. Uh, they represent the structure of a program. Class declaration contains of some components. Function declaration contains of function body. Uh, specification of parameters, of course, a specification of parameters, etc. Uh, 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 black, uh, black arrow, for example, here and here represent type information. That function declaration returns 
something of type float. And attribute is uh, the names of entities, of program entities are, uh, are known uh, as uh, attributes, attributes of such a tree. Represents the semantic relationships between the occurrence of M here or here and the body of the class. This is just an example. In uh, reality, there are very many such semantic uh, relationships. Uh, next slide, please. And the last point here on the same uh, uh, AST is so-called hidden semantics. This is very typical to many complex, uh, complicated languages. And in case of C++, the hidden semantics of this small snippet is that when the control flow leaves the body of the function, all local objects should be uh, destroyed. Uh, C is the local object and it should be destroyed as all other locals. What means uh, destroy, uh, dis uh, destruction of, a, of an ent entity of a class type? This means the corresponding destructor should be invoked. We don't need to write such a destructor here explicitly, but we must specify the, such an action. We should add the corresponding node to this AST uh, to represent such an action, calling the destructor of the class C capital. Again, this is very, uh, very uh, short uh, explanation of my ideas related to semantic representation. Again, in reality, this is a very, uh, very complicated task to represent all, <coughs> all the details specific to the semantic of a particular language. Uh, go on, please. And my final slides are about why do we need uh, an advanced compiler architecture for a very practical, uh, practical aim. How to organize the uh, interconnection or integration of a compiler and an integrated development environment. Please. Again, the, the same picture in, the, in a different view. Compiler as a black box. This is a very typical thing. Uh, when a developer treats a compiler as a black box, he or she does, is not interested in what's inside. Yes, of course, we know, Andrei, we know what's inside. But in general, the only thing we uh, need to know is how to provide source files, how to provide corresponding compilation parameters, and that's it. We get the result, object files, and probably diagnostic messages. Uh, yesterday I made these, uh, these uh, code snippets from my, uh, on my machine. Uh, this is a part of a C-sharp program. It doesn't matter what it is about. Uh, notice that this is uh, the snapshot of the Visual Studio Editor, okay? Okay, it looks very uh, typical. We all know how programs look like in many different IDEs. Uh, my interest here is not in keywords. Look, keywords are highlighted by a special color and probably a special font. This is not a problem. Everybody understands that any editor, any text editor can detect keywords and uh, represent them, well, in a particular color. This is not a problem. This because uh, the, the set of keywords is limited and uh, each language reference manual gives us the full, full list of those keywords. However, my interest is here. Talking code in my case and identifier are types. How editor knows that these identifier represent types, not variables, but types. But it does represent them in a different way, in a different color. My question is how does it know that these things are types? The answer, well, probably we all understand the answer. This is why the editor asks compiler, underlying compiler, tell me what are these names? The next slide, please. Another 
another uh, code snippet, a uh, uh, snapshot. Look, uh, e editing my program, I wrote s, ro wrote dot, and I immediately get the list of members of s that are available in this context. The same question, how the editor knows about these members? And we, get, we, we all understand that the answer is uh, actually the same. Compile, uh, the text editor asks compile, underlying compiler. My idea is that text editor and compiler work together. Uh, I would tell you even more. When you, type, when you are typing your program, for example, writing such a code, the point is that in order to organize such a cooperation between ID or text editor and the compiler, the compiler should be organized in a different, in a non-conventional way. Next slide, please. Look at it. Now, compiler is considered not as a black box, but as a collection of resources. Those resources are data, different data are involved to the compilation process, Talk, uh, source code, tokens, tree, object code, etc. and a set of processors. Lexical analysis, syntax analysis, code generation. So, in that case, if a compiler is organized as a set of, as a collection of resources, then the environment can independently invoke different compiler components and independently get access to different data, data related to the compilation process. Simply speaking, when you type your program, IDE can periodically ask for different semantic attributes of, those, of the source you have already typed and, if necessary, invoke the corresponding uh, or the necessary uh, processors. Th this uh, happens, exactly this happens in Visual Studio. I was talking with uh, people from Microsoft and they, just they explained me this idea. Uh, I'm sure that many other ideas exploit the same scheme. Just, yes, yes. They, by the way, JetBrain have their own C++ parser uh, that uh, is organized in a similar way. Next slide, please. And I'm coming to the end. This is my last, uh, last slide. This is just as the previous one, but I have organized the conventional stages of compilation in this way to emphasize that both approaches, conventional and advanced, are can be uh, combined together. So this is the conventional compilation process and uh, data can be uh, organized as a separate components with their interface. Actually, these elements are, or part of these elements are sem composed semantic representation. Uh, I guess that's it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Excuse me? I have a question. Sure, sure, I'm ready to, to answer. Um, yeah, you, are, you were talking about the more complex intermediate representation for the languages, yeah? So, uh, what do you think about the compi compilation time? Because right now you are planning to create uh, mm -hmm. more complex, mm -hmm. more, uh, like, more specific, more, with more features, with more extra, extra functionality, AST tree. And uh, I think that it will uh, affect two main things. First of all, compilation time. And the second one is uh, um, the memory used by the compiler. Consuming itself, memory, yes. Consuming memory and the memory on the, like, on the disk, like uh, the uh, code size of the, of the project. So I'm asking these questions because uh, current uh, com compilers and current intermediate representation tries to solve this question. So they have a trade-off between the, the complex intermediate representation and the simple intermediate representation to That are internal compil uh, compilation structures, yeah. nothing else, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, Agreed. What, what, do you see the problem in it and how you... I do, uh, I, I do see such a problem, but okay, well, I'm a researcher. 
uh, I am not working for an industrial company. So uh, I can allow myself not to think seriously about that. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. But uh, I realize the problem, definitely. There are, uh, there are some uh, ideas related to uh, partial compilation. If you insert uh, a minor modification to a program, there are techniques and approaches that allow us to update the whole semantic representation in just that part that uh, related to the uh, latest modification. Uh, but uh, I'm not busy uh, with this uh, with this kind of research or implementation. But I completely agree with you. This is a problem. I, I knew uh, such a problem first time in uh, in the early 2000s when we were working with so-called visual age for C++ from IBM, from IBM, and this was quite a perfect perfect uh, software product however it required a lot of a lot of resources we had we had to uh, put extra memory to our server however I, I must say that uh, the extra cheap of memory costs much cheaper than uh, than the the, 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 the programmer's salary or uh, well something like that okay so Okay, I understand the problem. I agree with you. However, this is a little bit out of my professional interest. Yes. Maybe cloud computing can help. Uh, well, any uh, any storage, uh, any well, a kind of fast storage can help. Do you think we can create some sort of a semantic representation for different languages? One semantic representation for multiple languages. Uh, there are a lot of efforts in this uh, towards this direction. Uh, I was trying to think about that in early 2000s. Uh, I, uh, I had a kind of prototype for C++ and some small languages like Oberon and, uh, and Zonon, I, I mentioned that. But well, this is, this is a point of discussion. Look, well, well really, uh, uh, typically I tell students don't take care about syntax. Syntax can be different, can vary very in very wide range. However, semantic principles are very much similar in different languages. However, when you, when you try to uh, go to practice, you immediately see that semantics is different as well uh, and in, in many details. And uh, the direct approach could be just join join typical features from, from different languages and call it semantic universal semantic representation <laughs> well because we have llvm ir which is promised uh, to be llvm uh, is for different purpose That's for right. generating fast and efficient code mm -hmm. so it doesn't have a, a semantic a, a lot of semantics in it Unfortunately, oh well, well, this is, was not their idea. But but Clang had, uh, for example, Clang. Uh, yes. If someone doesn't know Clang, is C plus plus front end for LVM. Uh, has uh, a, a previously had an AST structure. A yes, that's AST right. Structure, yeah. And from the last year, they had uh, the different structure. Especially, they removed the AST completely, and they have now. Did they? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't remember the project name, but now now they don't have AST, and they have like some complex representation right now already. PC. It was PSI? Uh, no, you, you not, not PSI. That. PSI is for is just JetBrains no. invention ah, for okay. for oh. ah, sorry, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And for Clang, they created like I don't remember the name. Maybe Anton remembers how how it is called instead of AST. So they have like uh, something complex, more complex than AST. Probably I, I haven't heard about that, but but well well many researchers think uh, in, in the si similar way. similar uh, way. But even though LVMIR doesn't have so much semantics, I didn't find any tools which were working which can allow me to take Java and convert into LVMIR. So <laughs> LVM, they promised to be polyglot, but only C++ uh, can be uh, Well, Java exploits completely different execution model. So, and Java bytecode by uh, very much targeted at uh, object orientation support. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and well, it is not uh, the same as uh, LLVM uh, internal representation has. 
Well, because uh, LLVM internal representation is a kind of low level thing. Whereas Java bytecode uh, is much yeah. higher. But my point is that tools exist. They, they are on GitHub, but they don't work. I tried it. Python, Ruby, Java, I tried three of them. None of them actually work. So they exist there and they are abandoned. So people try well, well, and abandon. Yeah, so the I problem is you. inside the uh, internal representation. So the problem is inside the representation of the code. It seems like it's right. impossible. Right, yeah, yeah, right. I, agree, I agree with that, yes. So maybe we need some sort of a better, like you suggested, uh, better semantic representation. Well, well, in general, yes, I would be happy to have such a, a universal representation. But I realize quite well how it, how hard it is to design and implement it. Maybe it will be possible in the future to standardize it somehow. Like uh, software yeah, software. there are some standards. I forgot, uh, forgot uh, the name, but there are some standards uh, related to internal representation of programs. Uh, I forgot uh, their names, but they are the at least attempts or drafts, draft standard. Uh, well, well, we will see. I don't know. We will okay. we'll see. Yes, please. I have many questions about semantic. Uh, first of all, I want to start from a uh, question. What definition of program semantic do you use? <laughs> Informal definition. I okay. <coughs> uh, absolutely. However, uh, well, well, okay. My answer is informal uh, okay. de definition. Okay. I just read the uh, reference manual of a language uh, or standard and uh, extract the semantics. Okay. Okay. Do you use uh, in your uh, representation for semantics some formal, uh, conventional uh, uh, semantic representation like operation or like denotation or uh, like no. other things? Yeah, uh, I understand the answer. Uh, no, no, I okay, don't okay. use any. Uh, okay, then the next question. Why are you sure that you are using structure, for example, structure types, scopes, and you call hidden semantics, mm -hmm. and you uh, want to say that it's a semantic, but are you sure that uh, there is, uh, that it's enough? It's enough to, uh, to catch all things uh, that you need to then uh, generate, uh, or do things uh, you uh, want to. Okay, uh, my answer would be as follows. Uh, if you uh, need a tool, uh, for example, visualization tool or virtual machine for a language, uh, and such a tool would use that semantic representation via inter some programming interface, and if and when such a tool requires some, from the semantic representation something that that representation doesn't provide, then I would uh, conclude that I need something more in that representation. And now I cannot uh, answer about completeness of, uh, of such a representation. Well, it seems to me that this is more... Well, of course, I, I was talking about my project. I'm working on it for several years and it is far from being complete. And uh, now I guess that more or less all aspects are covered, but I'm not, not completely sure about that. Client tool will give the answer. If a client tool is completely happy about what, is, what does uh, semantic representation provides, then okay. If it asks, well, I need something that it doesn't provide, then I would conclude that I should add something to that semantic representation. Okay, and maybe how you evaluate your approach in your research? What do you mean evaluate? How should I evaluate it? For example, you uh, develop some semantic and you want to use it for some uh, downstream ah, uh, application. I see. And you, maybe you have some approach to do that. Uh, well, the approach is quite straightforward. I'm going to ask uh, my diploma students uh, and uh, next, uh, uh, this summer, uh, I would uh, pro suggest them topics related to this and I would ask them to write a visualizer for my semantic representation and we will see what, <laughs> what will happen. Do you think it's possible to make some formal evaluation? Probably this uh, is the uh, well, a lot of efforts uh, were done in this direction. 
you mean for formal you semantic definition? You bring it to the world and you say this is better, and everybody asks you why better. You already have this, so why yours is better? Uh, you well, uh, to be honest, I'm not a theorist. I should uh, have, or someone should have some theoretical, uh, theoretical uh, specialization to work on this. Well, your papers go in that direction. That's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I see. Uh, but, uh, excuse me, I'm not a theorist, I'm rather an engineer, and this is... Uh, okay, maybe then we can, com we can come up with empirical ideas how to prove something, empirical proof Definitely. to the students. Yes, yeah? yes, yes. We, uh, I hope that I will be able to uh, check uh, the validity of my uh, research uh, uh, when my students will do something practical uh, using uh, semantic representation. Thank you. But I guess uh, at the end it's clients who decide whether it's good or not. Yeah, yeah this all. is my, one of my points. Client decides whether it is good or not. It, it's, it's like in national languages. There are many languages and you can claim that your language is better than someone else, but basically it depends how many people are voting. Well, look, uh, 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 Jürgen Gutnecht uh, told me once that there was an attempt to formally define the semantics of module 2. Mm -hmm. And uh, the semantics of empty statement was, uh, uh, took 17 pages. Empty statement. This is, this is the example uh, your Gutnik told me. And nobody read it probably. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Who is someone unfortunate that has uh, to, uh, to read everything, everything there? It's just Swiss approach. <laughs> I, I don't know uh, who, who was doing this. Uh, not necessarily Swiss people. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you again.